Welcome back, everyone. This is Exploring Science, and we are here with our two excellent speakers, Delfina and Lily, and we're going to be doing our follow-up question and answer session uh, to make sure that we got to any question or answered during the live event. All right. So, Delfina, we have a couple of great questions for you. Uh, one of them, I think, starts with a little bit more about mutations, uh, since you talked a lot about heart defects, for instance. Uh, is it possible that a mutation could cause someone to be born with multiple hearts, and how would that affect them if so? Um, so I personally don't know in any cases where uh, someone has been born with multiple hearts. Um, I would imagine that they could potentially survive for a little while so long as them having multiple hearts doesn't affect their other organ systems. Because if you imagine the extra space in your chest that the heart would take up, it might put pressure on the lungs, it might put pressure on like the stomach or other organs that are in those areas and cause them to have problems functioning. Um, so I think, you know, it could be possible, but there would probably need to be some intervention, some surgical intervention to make that a better situation for that patient. That makes sense. I mean, maybe unless you're the Grinch and have a heart two sizes <laughs> too small, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. So maybe uh, on the flip side of that about beneficial mutations. So um, is it possible that you can have a mutation that benefits someone and especially something like increased metabolism or heart rate in a way that maybe makes you a better athlete? And can these things, these basically manifest in increased abilities to make you maybe not quite a superhero like we talked about, but some sort of superhuman? Right. So kind of like Lily mentioned in her presentation about Darwinian evolution and that great example of the spotted deer, there are some mutations that you could imagine improve your ability to survive uh, depending on what kinds of changes you're experiencing in the environment. So say, for example, um, you know, we're going through global climate change right now, right? So um, if you live closer to the equator and you have some kind of mutation that enables you to survive uh, you know, higher temperatures better, or at least be able to weather that better uh, than the average person, then you're more likely to survive, pass on those genes to your, to your children, and then, you know, give them a better chance of surviving in the world. Um, as for like superhuman mutations, I do know that there is a cool mutation that literally makes buff babies. So it increases the chance of like, uh, uh, inc having increased muscle mass without having to like do all the work out at the gym. Um, so whether how that impacts them as they grow to be adults, I'm not entirely sure. As you might imagine, having increased muscle mass might be great out here, but like if you have increased muscle mass on your heart, then that might increase your blood pressure, which is bad for your whole body overall. So I think the big takeaway with superpowers, and if you look up any uh, science background on uh, superpowers on YouTube, you always get the downsides. So like, what are the physical limitations of having superhero powers? So like the flash, if you have that superhuman speed, you have to have the joints that are gonna be able to keep up with it. You're not gonna be able to process things as quickly. And even if you do, like, you would be living years, if not decades, in the same amount of time as somebody's living seconds. So like, what is that going to have effects on you? So kind of like with Spider-Man, with great superpower and responsibility, like that, it just carries a lot of responsibility and a lot of consequences. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I've also seen similar videos talking about how cool it would be to fly, but also how many bugs you would get in your eyes and mouth <laughs> uh, and, and <laughs> how that's not ideal. And I remember learning in one of my neuroscience classes coming here first semester, even if we like, so rabbits have types of muscles that are way stronger, yeah. but if humans had that, it would just rip off of our bone because we're not like set up to, to handle that type of force. Yeah, so. there, like there's a tick that like literally moves like three or four times its body length per second. And like, it literally doesn't have the mental processing to make that full distance. So it has to go and then stop and then go and then stop because otherwise it would just like keep running into things. So. Awesome. Yeah. So there are still limitations, uh, even if you have a really cool power or something. And I've heard about the buff babies, and I think that also applies to uh, some cows and dogs, I think, too. So nice. Um, and so we talked, we're, we've been talking mostly about human mutations in DNA um, right now, but you mentioned throughout your talk that you've been studying frogs. So yeah. how is it that frog DNA can help us understand human DNA? So I think there are two big things there. 
One is the fact that even though, like, and this is the amazing thing about development, right? Like, we have a lot of similar DNA with frogs and with dogs and with mice and even with yeast. You know, there's a lot of talk about yeast in our discussion in the chat. Like, we share a lot of our DNA with them because they make a lot of the same proteins, right? So we have a lot of the same types of chemical reactions and cell structures as all of these organisms. So, you know, being able to study these proteins in frogs, um, you know, still gives us information because the proteins and the DNA itself is so similar. Um, the other part of it is at more of the organ level, right? So the structures in the frog are very similar to in humans. They may not have the exact same shape or the exact same number of valves or whatnot, but if you mutate that DNA that affects the protein that leads to changes in the structure in the frog, then we can use that to try and understand whether or not it can cause structural problems as we see in human disease. That's one of the, I think, most um, captivating things to me about biology when I was learning about development is that um, even though you know, humans and frogs are so different, the way that our cells become laid out in this, in this way is really conserved evolutionarily because cells and DNA have worked a long time to try to make this possible and it wouldn't want to reinvent the wheel, basically. Exactly. Awesome. And so it sounds like you've got a lot of really great answers and you mentioned that you're a mutant um, earlier. So are you a mutant that has super intelligence? That was a question that was asked in the chat. So could you elaborate on that for us a little bit? Yeah. So... Oh man, this concept of like intelligence and having super intelligence and having inherited intelligence, I think it's a complicated question because how we define intelligence is very uh, complicated, right? So there are a lot of structures of, uh, you know, in society about how we think about intelligence and what kind of intelligence is worthy versus not worthy, right? Because we may be talking about, you know, academic intelligence or, uh, you know, intelligence for critical thinking, whereas there are a lot of people who also have emotional intelligence and know how to mediate uh, arguments very well or able to read people really well. And those are also very viable types of intelligence. And there's also the side of it of like, you know, is this an ability or is it is it something that you learn or is it something that you're born with? And I think to many degrees, it has to do with the environment that you're brought up in and like what kinds of opportunities are available to you and, and you know, which opportunities you decide to go after. So like, yes, I am a graduate student in a PhD program, but, you know, I made choices very early on in my life to study really hard and you know once upon a time i wanted to be a doctor but then realized that wasn't something that i actually wanted i really wanted to study science and then that i really wanted to teach science so you know these studying really hard is really important if you want this kind of intelligence right um so yeah, just things to be aware of. But am I super intelligent? By no means. There are so many people who are smarter than me, and I think it takes a certain amount of um, courage and internal strength to acknowledge that. And it's okay. Like, if you're in a room full of smart people, you only have more things to learn, right? So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really perfect answer. And that's uh, I feel very similarly about that. Awesome. Cool. So uh, those are uh, just a few of the questions that we had, and I think we can turn it over to Josie and Lily so we can uh, hear some more interesting stuff from them. All right. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Delphina. Um, so we're going to turn to Lily now in her talk about life, the universe, and everything, but mostly about the life in the uh, universe. So uh, I think our, the first question we wanted to start off with is kind of actually similar to Delphina's talk. There's some very nice overlap today between the too. Um, so we were talking about mutants with Delphina's uh, talk, and then there was a question for you, Lily, about how um, could it, like, aliens have these boosted abilities? Could they maybe have, like, different mutations than us and be able to use maybe carbon dioxide of oxygen or something like that to survive? Yeah, I love this question because it's that kind of inventive thinking that we really need in this field when we're not sure what we're looking for. Because absolutely, life elsewhere could be so different from what we know on Earth and what we understand to be life, which is why it's so hard to come up with a definition that precisely covers all of that. 
Um, so carbon dioxide, sure, we could use silicon instead of carbon in this other life. Um, those who are interested in those who are like Mars, I encourage you to look up the moons of Saturn because that's another place in the solar system we're actually looking for life, but life that's very different than the life we find on Earth. For example, one moon of Saturn has an ocean that isn't made of water, but is made of methane instead. And we think that life could similarly exist in that ocean, just like it does in our water oceans on Earth. That's so cool. <laughs> I would never think that something could live in methane. Um, okay, I guess um, continuing off of this idea of kind of like, what is life, I guess. Um, could you talk a little bit about maybe the difference between um, like bacteria or animals? Um, there's some talk about viruses in the chat. And so someone specifically asked like, is bread not vegetarian because it has yeast in it? So talk about the differences there. Yeah, so um, if you remember, right, we were trying to come up with this definition of life to cover as much as we can. And so this covers all the life we have on Earth, which includes things like yeast, which you find in bread, you know, the vegetables you find in your salad, and even the animals that you might see on a farm. And all of these different forms of life share the things that I talked about. So the amino acids that form the proteins and the RNA and the DNA that gives you the capacity for Darwinian evolution. But then something like a virus that doesn't quite fit with our definition of life. And so it can't quite be considered alive because though it has DNA that it passes on, it's not self-sustaining. A virus can only survive by using the parts and mechanisms from another organism directly. Like, so instead of carrying its own enzymes, it uses the host that it infects that uses their enzymes instead. And so because in that way, it's not self-sustaining, it needs some other help, it's not quite alive. But other things, so like yeast, vegetables, those are alive, but I don't think they count for a uh, vegetarian because if a vegetarian didn't eat anything alive, but the vegetarian itself would not be alive either. Yeah, that's a great point, right? We still, anyone who's a vegetarian still needs to get their protein and all of the different parts of the food pyramid, right? Super important exactly, yeah. to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think another big question that wasn't answered um, that people seem super interested in is just, I feel like this is a question I've been asking since I was very little, um, of why is the sky blue? It seems that people in the chat kind of understand that the ocean is blue because it reflects the color of the sky, but then why is the sky blue? Yeah, this is a really excellent question, and it's one that I love to answer because it actually involves both physics and biology. And so to start off with the physics, um, the sky is blue because we have tiny particulates in our atmosphere that reflect light. And if you want to start sound really smart, use the word Rayleigh scattering is the name for the small particles scattering light. And this type of scattering preferentially scatters light of shorter wavelengths. So if you see a rainbow, right, you know that the top of the rainbow is red and the bottom of the rainbow is purple because the red wavelengths have longer wavelengths and the purple the color has shorter wavelengths. So it's these blue and purple colors that have shorter wavelengths that are getting scattered more by the part particles in our Earth's atmosphere. But then everyone's like, well, then why isn't the sky purple? So the sky isn't purple because your eyes are actually just more sensitive to blue wavelengths of light. And so the sky isn't red because the atmosphere is scattering, uh, is not really scattering those colors as widely. And the sky isn't purple because your eye is more sensitive to blue colors. And so when we look at the sky, we see that it's blue. But then another fun fact is if you have larger particles in the atmosphere, so like water droplets, because it's just rained or it's going to, or it's very humid outside because it's summer and it's terrible, then the sky might turn red instead because those larger particles will scatter the light of longer wavelengths. So those red colors that we were missing before. Is that why like sunrises or sunsets, do you see more colors? That's exactly why. So if we see, imagine like a ball as our earth, when the sun is here, it's traveling through more of our atmosphere rather than when it's directly on top and it's just going straight down. And so because it's traveling through more of the atmosphere, it's getting scattered more. And so you see more of the colors. That's super cool. Um, I feel like that's a fantastic, like fun fact to have in your back pocket. So <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you for answering that. And Thanks to both of you for your time and talking with us today. Yes, yeah, our pleasure. It was great talking to you guys.